In 1935, an engineer climbed to the top of the Empire State Building, carrying a briefcase full of equipment that would destroy his life. Edwin Armstrong had just invented a radio system so clear, so free of static, that it made every existing broadcast sound like noise through a tin can. He demonstrated it to industry executives who sat in stunned silence. The technology was perfect. It was also a threat. Within hours, the most powerful corporation in America began plotting how to bury it, and him forever. That corporation was RCA, the Radio Corporation of America, which controlled the entire AM radio industry. Armstrong's invention, frequency modulation or FM radio, didn't just improve sound quality, it made AM obsolete. And RCA's chairman, David Sarnoff, Armstrong's former friend, would spend the next two decades destroying the man who had once made him rich. Armstrong fought back with patents, lawsuits, and demonstrations, but corporations don't lose wars against individuals. By 1954, broken and bankrupt, Armstrong would step out of a window and fall 13 stories to his death, yet his invention would survive him, rising from the ashes to become the global standard for radio broadcasting. Edwin Howard Armstrong was born in 1890 in New York City, the son of a publisher. As a child, he was fascinated by the new science of wireless telegraphy, he built crystal radio sets in his bedroom and spent hours listening to the faint crackle of Morse code signals bouncing across the Atlantic. While other boys played baseball, Armstrong climbed trees and telephone poles, stringing antennas higher and higher to catch distant signals. He wasn't just curious. He was obsessed with making the invisible visible, the inaudible loud. At Columbia University, he studied electrical engineering under Professor Michael Pupin, a pioneer in telecommunications. Armstrong wasn't interested in theory for its own sake. He wanted to build things, to solve the fundamental problem that plagued early radio. Weakness. Radio signals were faint, drowned in static, barely audible. Armstrong believed the solution wasn't more power, it was amplification. In 1912, while still an undergraduate, he invented the regenerative circuit, a method of feeding a radio signal back into itself to amplify it exponentially. It was a breakthrough that made long-distance radio practical. The invention made him famous overnight in engineering circles, but it also brought his first bitter taste of corporate warfare. Lee DeForest, a rival inventor, claimed he had invented regeneration first. A patent war erupted that would drag through courts for 20 years. Armstrong won most of the legal battles, but the experience taught him a dark lesson. In the world of technology, credit often goes not to the inventor, but to whoever has the best lawyers and the deepest pockets. During the First World War, Armstrong served in the Signal Corps in France, where he developed another revolutionary circuit, the Super Heterodyne Receiver, which made radios far more selective and sensitive. It became the foundation of nearly every radio and television built for the next century. When he returned to New York in 1919, he was wealthy from patent royalties and respected as one of the greatest radio engineers alive. He sold his Super Heterodyne patents to Westinghouse and RCA for a fortune and became close friends with David Sarnoff, the ambitious young manager who was turning RCA into an empire. Sarnoff was a visionary, but he was also a ruthless businessman. He understood that radio was about to become a mass medium, and whoever controlled the technology would control the industry. Armstrong's inventions had made RCA dominant. Sarnoff rewarded him with stock, money, and influence. The two men seemed inseparable. Sarnoff even introduced Armstrong to his secretary, Marion McInnes, whom Armstrong would marry in 1923. For a decade, it seemed like Armstrong had everything, wealth, recognition, friendship, and a happy marriage. But Armstrong wasn't satisfied. AM radio, the system RCA had built its empire on, had a fundamental flaw. Static, lightning, electrical interference, and atmospheric noise filled broadcasts with crackling and hissing. Engineers had tried for years to filter it out, but the problem was inherent to amplitude modulation itself. AM varied the strength of the signal to carry sound, and anything that affected signal strength, like a thunderstorm or a passing car, created noise. Armstrong became convinced that the only solution was to abandon AM entirely and use a completely different method. In 1933, working in secret in his laboratory at Columbia University, Armstrong invented frequency modulation. Instead of varying the amplitude of the signal, FM varied its frequency. The result was astonishing. Static virtually disappeared. Music sounded crystal clear. Voices were natural. FM could also transmit a much wider range of sound, making it ideal for high-fidelity broadcasting. Armstrong knew he had created something revolutionary, something that would make AM radio obsolete. He was eager to show it to his friend Sarnoff, confident that RCA would embrace the technology. He couldn't have been more wrong. In 1934, Armstrong demonstrated FM to Sarnoff in RCA's New York headquarters. He set up his equipment and transmitted a broadcast from Long Island. The executives listened in silence. The sound quality was flawless. No static, no distortion, just pure audio. 
Armstrong waited for praise. Instead, Sarnoff's face turned cold. This is very interesting, Sarnoff said slowly, but I don't think it has a place in radio broadcasting. Armstrong was confused. Sarnoff explained bluntly, RCA had invested millions in AM infrastructure. Changing to FM would make all of it worthless. Armstrong tried to argue. FM was better in every way. It was the future. But Sarnoff wasn't interested in the future if it threatened RCA's present. The meeting ended badly. Armstrong left the building stunned, realizing that his invention, the greatest achievement of his life, was being rejected not because it didn't work, but because it worked too well. RCA wanted to protect its AM empire, and Armstrong's FM radio threatened to destroy it. The friendship between the two men ended that day, replaced by a cold war that would consume the rest of Armstrong's life. Determined to prove FM's superiority, Armstrong decided to demonstrate it publicly. In 1935, he rented space at the top of the Empire State Building and installed a transmitter. He invited journalists, engineers, and musicians to listen. The demonstrations were spectacular. Orchestras sounded like they were in the room. Voices were clear and natural. Even skeptics were convinced. Newspapers ran stories hailing FM as the future of radio. Armstrong was vindicated, or so he thought. Behind the scenes, RCA was already preparing its counterattack. Sarnoff's strategy was simple. Delay, obfuscate, and starve FM of resources. RCA controlled the Federal Communications Commission through lobbying and political connections. It began filing technical objections to FM, claiming it was experimental and unproven. It lobbied the FCC to limit FM to a narrow frequency band, crippling its potential. When Armstrong applied for licenses to build FM stations, RCA used its influence to delay approvals. The company also refused to manufacture FM receivers, ensuring that even if FM stations existed, no one could listen to them. Armstrong fought back the only way he knew, by building his own network. He spent his entire fortune constructing FM stations and funding independent broadcasters. He gave away his patents to anyone willing to build FM equipment. He traveled the country, demonstrating FM to anyone who would listen. Slowly, a grassroots movement formed. Small broadcasters, musicians, and engineers saw FM's potential and began adopting it. By 1940, there were dozens of FM stations on the air, and the sound quality was undeniable. It seemed like FM might win through sheer superiority. Then World War II began, and RCA saw its opportunity. The company convinced the government that FM frequencies were needed for military communications. The FCC, under pressure from RCA, reassigned FM to a completely different part of the spectrum, rendering every existing FM transmitter and receiver obsolete overnight. Armstrong's network was destroyed. Millions of dollars of equipment became junk. Broadcasters who had invested in FM were ruined. The decision was technically justified as necessary for the war effort, but everyone knew the truth. RCA had used the war to kill FM. Armstrong was devastated but refused to give up. After the war, he began rebuilding, but RCA escalated its attacks. The company filed lawsuits claiming that Armstrong's FM patents infringed on RCA's earlier AM technology, a laughable claim to any engineer but effective in court. RCA had unlimited resources for legal battles. Armstrong did not. The lawsuits dragged on for years, draining his savings and consuming his energy. Every victory was appealed. Every settlement was rejected. RCA's goal wasn't to win. It was to exhaust Armstrong until he had nothing left. By the early 1950s, Armstrong was nearly bankrupt. His marriage was strained. His health was failing. He had spent millions defending his patents and had nothing to show for it. RCA, meanwhile, was thriving, still broadcasting in AM and lobbying to keep FM marginalized. Armstrong became bitter and withdrawn. Friends said he aged a decade in just a few years. The cheerful, optimistic inventor who had once climbed trees to string antennas was now a gaunt, exhausted man haunted by lawyers and debts. In 1954, after another brutal legal defeat, Armstrong's wife Marion left him, unable to endure the endless stress and poverty. Armstrong was alone in his New York apartment, surrounded by legal documents and unpaid bills. On the night of January 31st, 1954, he wrote a short note to Marion apologizing for everything. Then he put on his coat, hat, and gloves, opened a window, and stepped out into the winter air. He fell 13 stories. His body was found the next morning on a third-floor balcony. He was 63 years old. The newspapers reported it as a suicide, the tragic end of a broken man. RCA issued a brief statement expressing regret, but offered no comment on the legal battles. David Sarnoff, the man who had once been Armstrong's closest friend, said nothing publicly. To the world, Edwin Armstrong was a forgotten engineer who had lost a business dispute. But those who knew him understood the truth. He had been destroyed by a corporation that couldn't tolerate competition, even when that competition was superior. Yet Armstrong's story didn't end with his death. Within months, Marion Armstrong took up her husband's legal fight. She hired new lawyers and pursued RCA with a fury that matched her late husband's determination. 
She wasn't interested in money. She wanted vindication. For years she fought, and slowly the legal tide began to turn. Courts started ruling in Armstrong's favor. Patents were upheld. RCA's claims were dismissed. In 1967, more than a decade after Armstrong's death, RCA finally settled, paying Marion a substantial sum and acknowledging Armstrong's patents. But the real victory came not in the courtroom, but in the marketplace. By the 1960s, FM radio was growing rapidly despite RCA's resistance. Music lovers discovered that FM's high-fidelity sound was perfect for the new stereo recordings flooding the market. Rock and jazz stations adopted FM because AM couldn't reproduce the full range of electric guitars and drums. Classical music broadcasters moved to FM because it captured the nuances of orchestras. FM's technical superiority, the very thing RCA had tried to suppress, became impossible to ignore. By the 1970s, FM had overtaken AM in listeners and advertising revenue. The networks that RCA had built to dominate AM were obsolete. Ironically, RCA itself was forced to invest heavily in FM just to survive. The corporation that had tried to kill FM ended up profiting from it, though not as much as it would have if it had embraced the technology from the start. Armstrong's invention, rejected and buried for decades, had become the global standard. Every car radio, every home stereo, every portable device with a radio tuner used FM. Armstrong had won, but he hadn't lived to see it. Today, Armstrong's name is little known outside engineering circles, but his influence is everywhere. FM radio broadcasts to billions of people daily. The superheterodyne circuit he invented is in virtually every wireless device, from smartphones to GPS units to Wi-Fi routers. His regenerative circuit helped launch the age of electronics. His inventions are foundational to modern telecommunications, yet most people have never heard of him. There are no monuments, no holidays, no popular films about his life. Just the quiet hum of radio waves carrying his legacy across the world. Armstrong's story is a reminder that progress often comes at a terrible cost, especially when it threatens powerful institutions. He was right about FM. He was right about its superiority. He was right that it would transform broadcasting. But being right wasn't enough. RCA had money, influence, and control over regulators. Armstrong had only his inventions and his integrity. In the battle between genius and capital, capital almost always wins, at least in the short term. But history is long, and eventually truth has a way of asserting itself. The tragedy of Edwin Armstrong is not just personal, but systemic. How many other inventors have been crushed by corporations protecting obsolete business models? How much innovation has been delayed or destroyed because it threatened existing profits? Armstrong's case is unusual only because it's well documented. The patent wars, the regulatory capture, the financial warfare, these tactics are still used today. The names change, the technologies evolve, but the pattern remains. Incumbents resist change, innovators suffer, and progress is slowed. Yet Armstrong's life also offers a strange kind of hope. He lost everything. He died in despair. But his invention survived. FM didn't die with him. It couldn't be buried because it was simply too good. No amount of lobbying or litigation could change the physics. FM was clearer, more reliable, and more efficient than AM. Eventually, the world recognized that. Armstrong's personal defeat was absolute. But his technical victory was inevitable. In the end, the quality of the idea mattered more than the power of its enemies. Marion Armstrong lived until 1979, long enough to see FM radio dominate the airwaves. She never remarried. She devoted the last decades of her life to preserving her husband's legacy, donating his papers to Columbia University and funding scholarships in his name. In interviews, she spoke of him with a mixture of pride and sorrow. He had been a brilliant man, she said, destroyed by greed and arrogance. But his work had changed the world. That was some consolation, though it couldn't erase the pain of how he had died. Edwin Howard Armstrong was not a businessman or a politician. He was an engineer, someone who believed that good technology would speak for itself. He thought that if he built something better, the world would embrace it. That naivety cost him everything, but it also made his inventions possible. He didn't compromise. He didn't cut corners. He didn't design FM to fit within RCA's business model. He designed it to be the best possible radio system. That purity of purpose, that refusal to accept anything less than excellence, is what made FM revolutionary. It's also what made him vulnerable. In the decades since his death, the telecommunications industry has erected no statues to Armstrong, funded no museums, named no awards after him. The corporations that profit from his inventions rarely mention his name, but every time someone turns on a radio and hears music without static, every time a signal travels through a superheterodyne circuit, every time wireless communication works as it should, Armstrong's genius is present. His legacy isn't carved in stone. It's transmitted through the air, invisible and essential. Like the radio waves he spent his life perfecting, 
The story of Edwin Armstrong and FM radio is a case study in how innovation actually happens, not in the sanitized narratives of corporate history, but in the messy, brutal reality of technological change. Armstrong invented something better. He demonstrated it, he proved it, and he was destroyed for it, not by technical failure, not by lack of vision, but by the deliberate actions of a corporation that valued control over progress. RCA's victory was temporary, Armstrong's was permanent, but he paid for it with his life. There's a photograph of Armstrong from the 1930s standing next to one of his early FM transmitters. He's smiling, confident, holding a piece of equipment he built with his own hands. He looks like a man who has solved an impossible problem and knows it. Within 20 years, that same man would be dead, ruined by the very industry he had helped create. The photograph is a monument to both human brilliance and human cruelty, a reminder that genius is no shield against power, and that the cost of innovation is often paid by the innovators themselves. Edwin Armstrong heard the future. He built it. He tried to give it to the world. The world, or at least the corporations that controlled it, tried to bury him for it. But the future couldn't be buried. It waited, patient and inevitable, until the men who opposed it were gone. And then it arrived, exactly as Armstrong had imagined, clear, powerful, and undeniable. FM radio conquered the airwaves. Armstrong's victory was posthumous, but it was total. The man who fell from a window is forgotten. The invention that killed him is eternal. In the end, the signal outlasted the noise. 